Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Health and Care Hustings 2021 ahead of the Synev election uh, on the 6th of May. Now this Hustings has been organised jointly by the BMA Cymru Wales, uh, the RCN, so that's British Medical Association, the Royal College of Nursing Wales and the Welsh NHS Confederation to ensure that the health and social care policies of the main political parties are scrutinised and I'm sure you can all agree health and social care is going to be such an important topic um, for the upcoming years, especially with the recovery from COVID-19. It also allows for the members of those organisations, including the Welsh NHS Confederation's Policy Forum, uh, to raise the questions and issues that are most uh, important to them. Um, and it's not just here that you can listen uh, to the views. We also encourage debate on uh, on Twitter. It's healthy to debate these kinds of policies, um, but we just ask you to use the hashtag Sinev2021 on, uh, on, on Twitter. That's hashtag Sinev2021. And there is a Welsh uh, translation service available, um, and this can be accessed by telephoning 0300 088 5830. That's 0300 085830 uh, and by using the Zoom meeting ID 8821303 and that passcode is 599847 well man vra man vra vian a sinev kin etholiad mis my man right ev cal kaderio um a uh, cavalvod uh, a ma igal igal at hebion mas or 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 later yon a vidna sinev uh, and a pim lunev nessa um and just to introduce myself my name is peter gillibrand uh, i'm a, a journalist at global which includes lbc heart capital uh, lbc news um i'm very privileged to have been invited to this uh, hustings uh, health is such an important topic to me uh, and i've um it's been a, a, a privilege, albeit very sad over the last year, to cover the COVID-19 uh, crisis. I also have um, a few uh, personal connections with health and social care, um, just to give myself a bit of credibility. My brother's severely autistic, um, so I've grown up fighting for him uh, uh, throughout the, 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 the um, social uh, care and, and political system. Um, I'm also a very big advocate of, of running and social prescribing uh, to ensure a healthier uh, a healthier future. Um, so that's just a bit about me. Uh, to allow for uh, the smooth running of the event, it was asked that questions were submitted in advance and we have had a significant number of them which will allow for a broad and varied set of topics to be discussed. Uh, the questions have been split into four areas for you tonight. These are workforce, population, health, uh, population health, sorry, uh, collaborative delivery um, of care and services and social and community care. Um, and while the candidates are aware of the four discussion areas, um, they have uh, they haven't had to any sight of, of, of the questions. Um, we are joined uh, by in alphabetical order, um, Reen Ap Yorwerth, um, the uh, Plaid Cymru Shadow Health spokesperson, Angela Burns, the Welsh Conservative Shadow Health Minister and Vaughan Gething, Welsh Labour's health spokesperson and of course Minister for Health. Um, and before the first topic though, we will invite each candidate in turn in alphabetical order to explain in three minutes what their party's health and social care priorities are and how the health and social care portfolio will be administered if their party forms the next Welsh Government. Um, and going by alphabetical order, um, Reen, uh, would you like to kick us off please? Uh, uh, Peter, uh, very good evening to you all. Good evening to uh, to Angela and to Vaughan and all of you uh, tuned in this evening. And I've got to start by just taking advantage of this opportunity once more just to say thank you to all uh, your members in your various organisations, in sort of doctors and nurses, plus of course the myriad of other health professionals to all those managing the health service through this incredibly challenging time over the past year just a big big uh, thank you and to the organizations you know the, the organizations that have uh, organized this uh, this evening's uh, session you know we as as party health uh, spokespeople we work closely uh, with you and it's through you that we of course uh, get many of the ideas that give us 
uh, vision of how we can uh, best um, uh, provide health and care services in, in Wales. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity in this election uh, to talk about some of the things that are, are important to, to Plaid Cymru. We'll be able to go into them in detail uh, over the next hour and a half. But just to give you an idea of the sense of priority for, for me, when we move forward uh, from this point, um, we're not just trying to get us back to where we were. Um, Angela and I have certainly been, been emphasising that we weren't happy with where we were anyway. But given the scale of the challenge and given that one of the problems that I think exasperated the, 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 the issue was, was the sheer unsustainability of the NHS and care services in Wales as they were, we have to now build on the support and the recognition of the importance of health and care in Wales among the general population. We have to kick forward to delivering health and care in a way that is more uh, preventative in nature, that is more sustainable in terms of its workforce, in terms of its finances uh, in future. And that's why Clyde Cymru in this election is saying we want to establish a national health and care service for Wales, recognising what we've all remembered in the past year, that care is as important as health. Not a reorganisation of the uh, of the various institutions, but a new framework nationally for how those institutions work together to deliver health and care in a better way, giving parity of esteem and uh, terms and conditions of employment for staff in the care sector compared with with health, bringing pay uh, up for those in in care, attracting more people uh, into uh, care putting an emphasis on the preventative in the way that's never been done before in order to build a more healthy population and giving us the kind of staffing, the kind of sustainability and workforce that has been talked about for long enough but hasn't been delivered and now is the time. More and more young people want to go into health and care so let's tap into that enthusiasm and give them the support to create health and care as we would like to see it delivered in Wales. Just on time. And next up, we have um, Antha, if you'd uh, like to uh, to start your uh, your three minute speech. Um, thank you and good evening, everyone. It's an old saying, but nonetheless true. Prevention is better than cure. And that truth is reflected in the Welsh Conservative Manifesto, which unashamedly cleaves to that principle. You will see that we recognise the difficulty of transformation, not tweaking around the edges, but true, effective, whole system transformation and the difficulty of achieving that without sufficient funds to carry it through. We recognise that without adequate pump priming, we're basically asking people to swim with a hand tied behind their back at best, the two feet and their, with both hands and their feet bound at worst. And this is why you will see our NHS Covenant Bill committing to year on year real time increases in health and social care funding each year of the next Welsh Parliament. And I'm not simply talking about transformation of hospital services and IT, but transformation of the citizens' engagement with their health, about transformation in communities and within groups that struggle to achieve good health outcomes. The second inescapable truth is we don't have the workforce. We need more of pretty much everything, everybody. Doctors, nurses, physios, occupational therapists, care staff, both in residential and domiciliary, social workers, specialists in mental health, perinatal health, community nursing, eating disorders, the list goes on. And therefore, you will see in our manifesto an overwhelming focus on recruiting staff, retaining staff, on enabling career progression and retraining, on protected time, on CPD, on widening uh, careers to within the health and social care groups and ensuring that people who've always thought this type of future, this type of career was out of their reach, either financially or because of barriers in education. The health of the nation relies on us helping people not to get sick. It relies on us offering support and choice, education, early intervention, top class facilities, leading edge technologies and superlative diagnostics and care. The well-being of the nation relies on us making sure that housing is fit for purpose, that community based services are available, that stigma is silenced, that the troubled teen with an eating disorder, the elderly person desperate to return to their own home, the new parent in abject misery, the fearful and the forgotten are all scooped up. It's a hell of a task, but it's vital that we undertake it. The nation needs to have vastly different socio and economic outcomes to the ones we see at present. The health and social care sectors are on their knees because of workforce issues and the overall fragility of services. Health boards are trying to engineer substantial changes with little in the pot. 
And we're all looking to primary and community services to pull the rabbit out of the hat to support a population with all their health, well-being and social care needs. And this is before we even begin to deal with the fallout from COVID. I'm not going to talk about COVID, you know, the consequences of the pandemic better than I. And I'm not going to give you an endless list of all the policies we have, many of which have been shared already. And during the course of this evening, we can talk about more. But I want to go back to where I started. Transformation and people. That innovative, gutsy, can-do attitude deployed by so many organisations dealing with the pandemic. We need to maintain that momentum, bottle the lightning and make the change. Thank you for bringing that to an end there. Um, and next up is uh, Labour's Vaughan Gething. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for all the organisations who have put together uh, this hosting tonight to have uh, what I hope will be uh, a conversation, no doubt, with some sharp edges between <coughs> the politicians. In terms of our priorities, I want to set out some of the priorities in our manifesto that we've already published, but then some more I think is the absolutely essential context we're going to need to work in. Uh, and the starting point is to complete the pandemic and our response to it, because we're not through the pandemic yet despite the fantastic success of our vaccination programme and all of the staff and volunteers who have made that work, we still have more to do. There are more difficult choices in the weeks and months ahead, and our scientific advisors continue to warn us of the possibility of a further wave later this year. And that means following the public health and the scientific evidence and advice, being upfront about what we're doing and all the difficult choices we still have to make. But we will go through the pandemic in this next term, and that's why our headline pledge is about a recovery from the pandemic. That's an economic recovery because actually the health of the nation is absolutely determined by the wealth and the spread of wealth in the nation. It's also about our health and care system recovering and transforming. We've already made £100 million available for the early work on that to start, and that recovery and that transformation for the future is not simply a question of waiting lists in secondary care. It is about prime and community care. It is about mental health and it is about the unfinished journey together between health and social care. And to do that, we are committed to training even more staff. We have a good record over this last term in continuing to invest in our staff continuing to maximise the number of staff we train across all professions, doctors, dentists, nurses, midwives, therapists, scientists. We're committed to recruiting 12,000 more people from training and of course the new medical school in North Wales and that goes alongside our commitment to the real living wage for care workers and the way that we need to reform the way that the social care system works of itself but as well as the integration that is still required with our health system. And we think that our pledge for a chief social care officer with a seat of the harder government will help to do that, to raise permanently the awareness and uh, I think the professional respect for our social care workforce. Well, that will have to go alongside not just integrating in organisational terms, but in practical terms about how reform has taken place. And our experience with transformation funding has shown us that money can help, but it's mostly about people and leadership and much of that comes from the ground in terms of the best ideas to change and permanently improve healthcare. But it does mean some structural changes, that's why we have to carry on with a process that won't feature on many leaflets, but contract reform is so important for reforming where the access and primary care works together. Add to that the challenge of the pandemic, a decade of austerity, the challenge of recovery, increased well, need minutes. for the opportunity to reform and deliver a generally sustainable health and care system and that is the prize we have before us. Thank you very much um, for those opening statements. Um, so we'll first go uh, now uh, to the first subject area and I've got the questions here. Just a reminder to all candidates there are a lot of them and we're going to try and cover as many as we can. Um, so um, just try and keep it as uh, as short as possible because I'm sure everyone watching will, uh, will at home will want to um, to hear what you have to say. Um, so yeah, workforce is the first topic area and before each section we've got um, a few videos to play. So the first ones are from the Welsh NHS Confederation and the Royal College of Physicians. I'm Darren Hughes, Director of the Welsh NHS Confederation. The membership body that represents NHS organisations in Wales. We're at a fork in the road moment for health and social care in Wales. Since the coronavirus pandemic, 
politicians on all sides have told us how much they value the NHS in Wales. Now is their opportunity to show it. There are many challenges facing our health and care services, all of which have been exacerbated by the direct and the indirect effects of COVID-19. It has never been more important for us to work together to provide a sustainable health and social care sector. Leaders across NHS Wales have told us we're going in the right direction, but political parties must support the NHS and social care staff get where we need to. We believe that the health and care system fit for the future must provide person-centred care that is compassionate and joined up across all sectors. The focus should be on delivering joined up models of care based on individuals' needs by introducing performance measures that focus on quality-based outcomes, prevention, community services, and vitally important, whole system collaboration. We're calling for a sustainable and viable health and care system that is fit for the future. Will you support us? As we emerge from the impact of the second wave, combined with winter pressures and clinician exhaustion, it's time to think beyond the pandemic. That's why the Royal College of Physicians is calling on the next Welsh Government to increase the number of doctors across the medical workforce. NHS workers deserve fair, filled rotors, protected time for education and research, and time to rest before they begin to tackle the backlog. The NHS must now offer flexible working arrangements, invest in diagnostics and new technologies, improve recruitment and retention. This is not just about offering well-being workshops and resilience training to individuals, it's about whole system change. As we recover and rebuild the NHS, we must also address longer term issues of health inequalities and bring together fragmented health and social Uh, I don't know what exactly happened there. There seems to be a technical issue and um, we'll try and get that um, played uh, uh, again uh, in full um, for you. Uh, I'm in talks with the, the technical guys um, on, the, on the other end of that. Um, but let's start with questions. We are a bit um, later uh, than planned as we started uh, later, but the, um, all these questions have been submitted by, uh, uh, by members. And the first topic is workforce. Um, so let's get into it. Um, first question, and I want Vaughan to answer this first. Um, last month, the UK government recommended to the pay review body that healthcare in England covered by the agenda for change should receive a 1% pay rise. How would your party ensure all healthcare staff in Wales receive the fair and meaningful pay rise and what do you consider to be fair? OK, well, I think that the announcement that England made, the Conservative government in England, was a real kick in the teeth for staff in the NHS, because that is the start of imposing another round of austerity. And I think that, you know, staff really did not feel valued when that announcement was made, not just in England, but it leaked into Wales as well, because that's a statement of value apart from anything else. I've been very clear, not just in the payments that were made to social care twice and the NHS now recently as well uh, for the extraordinary work been done during the pandemic, but I've been really clear that the pay review body don't have an artificial cap on their recommendations. And we have been clear with uh, workforce representatives, including trade unions, that we want to meet the recommendations of that pay review body and we'll talk with them once the recommendations are made. That's part of the challenge, setting up what is a fair pay award, because that's why you have this pay review body process. So I want to see what that comes to us. And I'm committed to wanting to implement that pay review body process. I've already acted there, of course, before the election took place, not just with the bonus, but also in making sure that the NHS remains a real living wage employer. So we're putting our money where our mouth is on this, and that's the right thing to do, because otherwise you can get into an auction with other parties rather than having the respect that the process of delivering a fair and sustainable pay award means. But it does also mean that if the UK Exchequer is going to squeeze money out of public service and the health service, that has real consequences for the choices the whole Welsh government can make and not just in the health field. Uh, um, what 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 um, do you consider to be fair in terms of a percentage? Sorry, just to get that clear. Well, I'm not setting a percentage because that's why we have a pay review body. Well, process. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't the members who are watching right now just want to know what you think is fair before heading into the office? Again? I think that 
well, why have a pay review body process if I'm going to sit here and determine a, a figure out of the air ahead of the election? I think people would be deeply suspicious of that. And I can tell you, Peter, I've had several conversations with healthcare trade unions wanting to know that their pay review body process is going to be respected. They'll have a process that isn't down to the whim of a politician before an election or in the middle of it. And it's why the challenge about getting through the decade of austerity has been so important. The pay rise that was given for a gender for change staff was the start or the end of the process. And medics who are involved in today's call will know that I have met all of the pay review body recommendations for doctors and dentists. We've done the right thing. We've got a track record of doing the right thing, and that's what you'll get with Welsh Labour. Uh, Reen, um, you're next. What, what do you think of what uh, Vaughan said there? And what, 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 <laughs> what do you consider to be fair? Well, the 1% was derisory. It was an insult. It would have been an insult at any time. But coming at the end of the year that we've just had, it was uh, 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 the deepest insult possible, a pay cut. Uh, and let's call austerity what it is, it's cuts. Uh, and it is another cut and asking health staff to take to, to bear the impact and bear the brunt of that cut after this year of, of COVID uh, says a lot, I, I fear, uh, about uh, the government that, that made that, that suggestion. Um, yes, we do need to um, uh, go through the proper system uh, and look at uh, what recommendations are made by the pay uh, review body. And, and I, I, I agree with Vaughan that, that it's not up to, to a politician at this point in the political cycle to, to throw figures uh, around. You know, I, I have no doubt that um, we should see the undoing of the effect of the um, 10 years of, of cuts, which would, which is why nurses, for example, have been asking for 15%. Now we know that you know, giving a 15% pay rise in one go is extremely difficult for, for any government anywhere, but that is the kind of place that we need to be looking to get back to. Let's see what comes out of the pay uh, review uh, body uh, and absolutely make sure um, that staff working in the health um, service are rewarded properly as much as I welcome any additional bonuses in, in COVID, it's not bonuses that health and care workers want, it's sustainable, uh, good uh, pay. That's what we need to put in place for, for the long term. And I remind you again, this is about making sure that care workers also uh, are able to say that they are being paid properly as well, which is why we say minimum uh, £10 an hour in this election, because we have to look holistically at health and care. And of course, putting health and, uh, and care workers on the same terms and conditions too. So you're not committing to a uh, to a specific percentage? I think it's very difficult and I'm not sure um, those tuning in uh, to this this evening would expect a, a number. What we have to have is a situation where we know that pay is fair and the suggestion of a 1% pay increase at any time, as I say, but especially at the end of that year, was deeply, deeply insulting. Mm. Angela, what do you make of it uh, all? Obviously, the Conservatives in the UK government with the 1% pay rise. What do you think of that and what do you think is fair? OK, um, so to get to the last question first, which is the important one, am I going to recommend a percentage increase? And the answer is no. What we have clearly said in public is that we will implement in full the findings of the independent pay review. We've also said in public that we would have a minimum £10 an hour um, as a starting uh, wage for those in the care sector. But I've also started discussing with uh, some of the professional bodies the whole uh, process behind Agenda for Change. And I'm very proud that Agenda for Change has actually brought people up out of, um, you know, beyond below minimum wage practically and got them onto really good salaries. And it's transformed the pay packets of, you know, all of our band one to four. What it hasn't done is it hasn't put more money in the pockets of bands five and above, not significant sums of money. And what I think we need to do now is say that Agenda for Change worked its purpose, but now we need to look at the particular um, staffing areas, the particular professional sectors, and see what we need to do to recalibrate their pay bands. And finally, Peter, if I may say that one of the greatest iniquities is that people who are doing the same job within Wales in different health boards, and whether they're doing it as a full time job or an overtime job, whether they're acting as bank, they're all on totally different pay bands. And what we want to see is a uniformity of that so that if you are a band five nurse and you're working in Howell's 
and you want to earn some overtime, you don't have to go to the neighbouring health board in order to earn the same sort of money, because if you do that overtime in your health board, you don't get paid so much. Those are the kind of things that we need to sort out to make sure that people feel that they are getting the right kind of pay for the job that they do. And I, I know you said about the agenda for change there, but do you believe it should be more than 1% in Wales? Oh, whatever the, we've been very clear, whatever the independent pay review say, we will implement in full. And, you know, let's be clear as well that uh, that um, what the Conservative government in Westminster say about England is a view that they take on a bunch of statistics and evidence and discussions that they have within their country. I don't fight for that country. I fight for this one. We'll move on to the next uh, question uh, there. Remember, hashtag CNF 2021, if you have anything to say about uh, the, the pay rise there. Um, uh, will you commit to increasing the number of medical students to prepare the NHS for an ageing population? And how would your party ensure that we have a workforce with the skills and competences that will re be required to deliver future services? Um, Angela, would you like to start? Yeah, and the, the short answer is yes. Um, I'll expand on that a little bit. I know we're out, we're you know tight on time, um, but we've been very clear about the um, increases in medical um, students that we would want to see about the places that we will fund, and we've worked it out really clear, cl clearly. Um, and it's not just the obvious go-to's of doctors and nurses, although we've committed to twelve hundred more doctors, uh, three thousand more nurses. We've got the figures to prove how we can do it and where the money is going to come from. But we also need everybody else. We need the physios. And the OT. How much will that cost? Do you know where the money is coming from now? Is that on the top of your head? Yeah. So if we look at um, the way we are going to get 3000 extra nurses, for example, you know, let's be clear, you can't just magic them out of nowhere. So if you're expecting them on day two of a Conservative administration, Peter, they won't be there. But what we want to do is put in place the strategies to get that, because it's very easy for all of us actually to sit here, me included, and say, oh, we're going to get 3,000 nurses, but we don't have a plan for it. Well, we do. So let me give you one example. Um, so about £17 million will enable us to put in place a nursing apprenticeship system. That will allow us to um, encourage people from all walks of life who perhaps didn't necessarily think that becoming a going into the nursing profession was, you know, the, the, something that they could follow. It would allow us to grab school leavers when they finish their GCSEs to bring them into a paid for apprenticeship where their um, salary is paid, where their um, the backfill and the training is paid, where their um, their degree co their their course costs are paid for, and would enable us to actually bring that forward and to help populate that 3,000 nurses and NHS employers work out that um, by the time that, sit, that process is in place and the apprenticeships are working, we could probably use that to um, populate about a third of the nurses that we need in Wales and that cost there is 17 million quid. So you can, you know, we've got it all in different sectors of how we would do it because otherwise, you know, to be frank, talk is cheap. We've worked it out. We've got the details. Well, I'm sure um, all the main details are in uh, all three parties' manifestos, which are on the uh, relevant websites, I'm sure. Um, uh, Reen, let's go on to you about um, the, the number of medical students and, and the workforce and skills and competences. Um, if, if the good people of uh, Ennis Morn decide not to elect me in this uh, election, at least I, uh, the, the one thing perhaps I will look back uh, most proudly on is the campaign to um, uh, for medical education in, in Bangor. I'm, I'm glad that um, uh, both other parties represented here now also support having a medical school in, in Bangor. We we dragged them kicking and screaming. Uh, I remember, I, I, I remember, I remember one kicking uh, and screaming, saying that there was no 
was no case for a medical school in, in Bangor. I'm really pleased that, that, that now we're in a place where we can all agree that this needs to, to happen. Uh, we already have uh, medical training in Bangor in cooperation with Cardiff University. We are, I think now, um, whoever is in government after, after May, uh, going to be uh, moving towards having a medical school uh, in, in, in Bangor. Why do we need that? Listen, not only does a shortage of staff um, affect um, uh, so, so negatively uh, people in all parts of Wales who aren't have, able to have access to care, access to care as quickly as, as, they, as they like, but it's costing us a fortune uh, as well. If you look in, in Betty Kidwalida over recent years, I've no idea what the running total would be over, say, the last decade, but the tens of millions of pounds that have been spent on a agency staff uh, is something that, that we have to stop. It's money that is hemorrhaging from uh, the health and care uh, service that we need to use in a more sustainable way. And making sure that we have more uh, doctors trained is a part of that. That, of course, uh, applies to other health professionals and nurses uh, as well. But what I find really exciting about the expansion of medical training into, into the north of Wales, plus expansion in numbers in Swansea too, hopefully, is that we can teach medicine in a different way. We can teach medicine in a community uh, way that, that doesn't happen in, in Cardiff as, as excellent a medical school uh, as it is. With my sister being a lecturer there, I would I would say that. But we have to, you know, we have to have a centre of, uh, of excellence in delivering uh, medicine in a rural area, in the community, in a bilingual context. These are things that really excite me uh, uh, about what we can achieve uh, through medical ed education in Bangor. And as I say, because of the, the spend on, on agency staff as well, it makes economic uh, sense. And, and it saddens me that, that in England saw the light and Jeremy Hunt actually saw the light on this before. Uh, I'm going to have to move on to uh, to Vaughan because you were pretty damning of Betsy Kudwala, the health board there. And Vaughan, you've um, obviously been in, in government. What do you make of, of Reen's comments and, and what would you do um, uh, uh, to increase the number of medical students and all the uh, skills and competences? Well, again, we have a strong track record over this last term of increasing the number of medical students. Uh, the intakes for the current medical schools in uh, Swansea and Cardiff and the work that Cardiff have done to provide more medical education opportunities in North Wales. And actually the case that has been taken to a realistic level to deliver is partly because of the work that Bangor University have done with Betsy Cadwell at the Health Board. They've been really important in making the practical case that there is a, a, a medical school in North Wales that can and will be delivered. And that's part of the challenge here. When the evidence changes, you have to be prepared to make different choices. So there's the practical point about wanting people to have not just more places at undergraduate level, but also the further training where again, we have a really good record in Wales. It wasn't that long ago. We were talking about GP training places. We recruited 200 people to GP training places in Wales in the last year. So it's really strong performance showing that people do want to come to Wales. And the Train Work Live campaign that I started has been really successful. It's, it's really delivering the goods for Wales. The thing I would say, though, is that, you know, doctors and, uh, what, you know, think about what Reen was saying about training people in a different way. Actually, that is already happening. People are undertaking their training in a different way and making sure they get a different range of skills in the world they're going to work in. That's why the alternative training and education for other people is so important. So the increases in therapists, health scientists and also nurses, the people that doctors will work alongside is so important. Angela just wanted to retort on that. Angela? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that there have been increases and it's really welcome. But the other thing that hasn't happened and needs to happen in tandem is that people have not been given protective study time, the ability to do CPD, the ability to progress their careers, to move on. And if they you know, join as one kind of, say, a nurse in one area, to be able to get the training to move into another kind of area. So we've got that stagnation there. And that's one of the things that's leading to low morale and consequent loss of staff. Actually, that, 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 that challenge about making sure people can move around in their careers and be supported to work in different ways is one of the things we've had to see in the pandemic, not just with returners, but we need to see even more of that as part of the compassionate leadership that people on this call will know uh, quite a lot about. We're trying to move our health service in that direction of, because when I talked about mental health need, lots of mental health need will be in our staff. 
and our staff will need the ability to work differently because what they have done on our behalf in this last year when some of our staff will need time out of the workplace yeah. and the challenge of training lots of extra staff is partly about making sure we don't lose the staff that we have got some of those staff will though leave and our challenge will be incredibly difficult and all the slogans in the world won't take away from that very real practical and difficult challenge but the record we have of increasing medical education training places at both undergraduates but also the training places at speciality is a good one in Wales over this last five years I'm proud of the choices I've made but more than that the other healthcare professionals they will work alongside and it's really important not to just get stuck into only doctors or only nurses the service is made up of thousands and thousands of people in many many different roles I'm sorry, I just read one final comment on that if you have anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I live with, with, with a case in, in my constituency as it happened, which, which shows the legacy of the lack of action on this. In the town of Hollyhead, um, two surgeries have been taken over uh, by the uh, by the local uh, health board. Um, I have been inundated since uh, the collapse of, of services in Hollyhead with people in desperate uh, problem, uh, in desperate trouble trying to access uh, care. We lost our GPs. We don't have that ready supply. If that isn't a wake up call on uh, and no, you know, started increasing the number of medical training places doesn't solve that problem tomorrow. But my goodness me, it gives us a better chance uh, for the medium and the long term. And we have to see action right now to show that government is serious. And that's what applied government, applied company government would be. Serious. We are already doing that, Reen. We have done that successively over these last few years. And, and the train work live campaign that we started several years ago is actually really delivering the goods. And it's not just the government. Government. Actually, it's lots of our staff who are promoting Wales as a place to go and work. We do really well at the BMJ Careers Fair because of the fact that you've got junior doctors and other people in Wales promoting the opportunities to come train, work, and live here. So it's absolutely part of what we need to part of what we need to do. And actually, the challenge on having training places available that is also underway with HRW2. So people in this call will know those things are already happening. I'm. I'm, I'm uh, obviously, uh, very uh, uh, a disagreement there. Um, so I, I'm sure everyone has their opinions. Remember, hashtag CNEV uh, 2021. And just a reminder that there are um, translation services uh, uh, available. That's in the email sent to you after uh, registration. Um, yeah, if you check your emails, it's all in there. Um, but that service, the Welsh translation, Wasaneth, E Bobos, Sinshala Kamnag, Sidi Galada, E Bos, Sidi Kalehala. Um, uh, and Gunharach. Um, moving on now, um, we, we, we've overrun a bit on that topic, but it's two, th those are two very important questions, um, as you heard by the debate there. Um, we're into population health, um, a very uh, a punk uh, kiosk, as they say in Welsh, a very important um, topic. And first, uh, we've got videos by the British Lung Foundations and uh, the Samaritans. Here at Aspen UK and British Lung Foundation Wales, we're calling for the next Welsh Government to make lung health a priority. Over the last six years in the current Welsh Respiratory Health Delivery Plan, a great deal was achieved in terms of increasing take up of pulmonary rehab, better diagnosis and more training for healthcare professionals. But the pandemic swept that all away. More people than before understand the power and the risk of respiratory viruses, but all the services that were in place to, to support people have been greatly reduced. This can't go on. We need to restart respiratory services. We've been told that it'll take up to five years to, to get the NHS back on normal footing. And people with chronic lung conditions can't wait that long. We need an ambitious new respiratory health delivery plan to take us forward for the next five years of the CENIV. We need to have a right to rehab for all people living with lung conditions. We need to have better diagnostic hubs. And we need to tackle smoking station once and for all. health issue but it is also a major. My name is Sarah Stone and I'm Samaritans Executive Director for Wales. Samaritans Cymru exists to reduce the number of people who die by suicide. It's very important to remember that suicide is not inevitable. There are actions that we can take to reduce it. One of the things we can do is to mitigate the impact of economic shocks on those who are most vulnerable. Suicide is a major public health issue but it is also a major inequality issue. 
there is now overwhelming evidence of a strong connection between socioeconomic disadvantage and suicidal behavior. Admissions to hospital following self-harm are also two times higher in the most deprived communities compared to the most affluent. Suicide risk increases during periods of economic recession, particularly when recessions are associated with a steep rise in unemployment. And this risk remains high when crises end, especially for individuals whose economic circumstances do not improve. We know that growing up or living in poverty can have significant consequences for individuals and communities affecting health, education, social mobility, child development and life expectancy. We believe that a centralised strategy for poverty, which promotes cross-government and cross-sectoral involvement, is imperative for such a major public health issue. We need a strategy which mitigates the impact of poverty on individuals and communities and sits alongside economic strategies. We must increase the understanding of the link between emotional well-being and community. Investing in these areas can go a long way to reducing human, social and economic costs. Very moving uh, piece, that final one. And just a reminder, um, because they spoke about um, uh, suicide there, um, there are helplines available, like the call helpline on 0800 132 737. Um, and there's many resources online as well. Um, but next up, we've got population uh, health. The first question, let's get into it. Um, developing the relationship between all public services and citizens must be a priority for the next Welsh Government. This is from the uh, person who's asking the question. How would your party support the public to live healthier lives, take more responsibility for their health and well-being, manage their conditions and use services responsibly? Uh, Vaughan, um, uh, kick us off with that, please. Uh, well, this is part of what we've been starting to do about uh, Healthy Weight, Healthy Wales, but it's not just uh, a health service challenge because lots of this are about the choices we make in how we live our lives and the food we eat, how much we drink, exercise, smoking, they're all choices around us. And we know from the pandemic in particular that uh, that challenge is not evenly faced in every single community. You know, our least well off communities have the greatest public health challenges. And this is actually really, really difficult. Now, there, and I don't think you can try to say that it isn't because the challenge of persuading people to make different choices of wanting to take more responsibility for those choices can come across as a very preachy, directive uh, and frankly unpleasant finger wagging approach that won't change uh, the great majority of people's behaviour. And it's about getting alongside people to understand what matters to them, not just in their health and well-being, but the things they actually want to achieve. So that's why the campaign that we've been that we were running and we we're about to spend more money on and actually do more uh, together with citizens. It was interrupted by the pandemic is so important because you've got to have figures that people will listen to. They can be the work that's done in schools on healthy schools, I think has been uh, really impressive in so many ways, but the upward pressure from children and young people also has to be managed and met by also conversations that adults are having as well. So I think it's going to be a huge challenge regardless of the election result. You're going to see if we're in, Welsh Labour will carry on with the Healthy Weight, Healthy Wales approach. We've got lots of buy-in from different stakeholders and it really is about all forms of public service, but also employers as well. There's a big role here for employers in making workplaces, healthy workplaces, physical health and mental health and a whole range of other. We could be here all day talking about this because the economy matters, active travel matters. Uh, what happens in the environment around you? So the plans we have in the environment make a huge difference as well. There's lots in this space that is all going to need to work in the right direction. And the moment we have won't last forever to, ch to persuade people to change the way they live and not go back to the way that we used to live. And the pandemic, I'm afraid, will give us a bigger public health challenge to work with rather than actually uh, levelling up the healthcare inequalities we're used to seeing. So an active recovery there is the best way forward. And just a quick fun fact, Cardiff is apparently the most active city in the UK, um, according to one study. So that's uh, reassuring. Uh, Angela, going on to yourself now. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, the, the question are asked about uh, how do we bring the public with us and how do we persuade them to, you know, adopt um, a different um, 
a different relationship with their own health, I think would be the way of, of putting it. And I think that it comes from a number of different points and you know, we can't address them all in one go, but it's a mix of hard and soft uh, power, if you like. The things that government can do and which the Welsh Conservatives would do would be to look at areas of, um, for example, health and social care, about more workforce, about getting parity between the mental and physical health, about looking at integrated working, um, by putting national delivery plans into action. Um, the Clean Air Act, which is one of our fundamental um, uh, commitments within our manifesto. But we've also got the educational perspective, um, which is a slightly perhaps in some ways more soft. It's about not just providing sort of mental health and well-being services to people at school, college and university, but it's about educating kids on you know, what's good, healthy eating, um, eating skills for life. Reen and I sat on a committee where we looked at physical education. You know, if I had a magic wand and I was the education minister, I would actually increase the amount of time that people could spend on physical education um, within a school day, because I think that's so important to instilling those healthy habits. And that's the kind of thing that you can do as government, but you've got to have the buy-in, which is the soft buy-in from the general public. Um, and, and we obviously know the uh, the benefits running, cycling, uh, P does for mental no, health. It's not just that though, Peter, and I think that's one of the mistakes that people make because we think of PE and physical education as roughy tufty stuff, as, you know, sports, as kicking a ball around a soccer pitch. But, you know, girls, very self-conscious. Girls don't like having to do stuff like that in public. So girls actually would much rather go into the gym, put on some really good beat music and dance for an hour. That's really good for you. Cardiovascular, lifts up your mood, you know, all those things. We've got to be far more creative about how we say those awful dreaded words, P.E. Because to your average teenager, you know, they're quite an anathema. So we can do stuff like that. And also, you know, we're looking at population health. We've got to look at the community perspective. We've got to look at housing. We've got to look at the economy because, you know, a strong economy is also a determining factor in improving whole population health. And Reen, um, uh, what, what do you think about this all? Uh, people often sneer when politicians say I'm passionate about X, um, but but I think it, it, this has to be one of my biggest driving uh, forces sort of in, in, in politics, comes from my own experience, a lot of it in, in, in sport, but also sort of physical activity in, in, in general. Um, I, we have, let me tell you what, what my, what sustainability means to me, okay? I want us to be in a position, we're not there now, I want us to be in a position where we can spend health budgets on infrastructure for physical activity. I want everything to be so closely intertwined that we think of building a path or building you know, better housing for people to give them better qualities of opportunity, building a sports pitch, whatever it might be, as health spend. That's where I'd like us to, to be. So that, that gives you an idea of how integrated I believe this has to be into our planning, our planning for better health and, and care in Wales. There are a number of ways that we want to do that. You know, you'll read in our manifesto about this idea that I've been talking about for some time. Call it a gimmick if you like, but actually I think it, it could be something exciting where you go around schools and communities with properly funded sort of roadshow type things with a dual purpose. Uh, one, recruiting people into care and health jobs, and two, telling people about choices that they can make in their own lives to give them uh, opportunities to live uh, healthier. You look for opportunities at a younger age in changing it, the natural culture of a child. You look at what they're doing in some, some countries. I'm totally with Angela on uh, the, the, uh, the need to spend more uh, time in schools uh, promoting physical activity. And it isn't sport. Going for a walk, having a dance, whatever it might be, is all physical activity. This has to be... I, I want to be a minister known for, oh gosh, there he is again, he's banging on about how much more we could do ourselves to be more healthy and how determined he is to divert money, not away from health services, but to change the way we think about funding so that we're building a healthier Wales for the long term. I think actually in this area, Peter, you can find that there are opportunities for parties to work with each other. So on some of the harder stuff like um, food labelling, uh, labelling on alcohol, I think there's opportunities for cross-party agreement on some of those things. It's in part of our plan. 
Uh, there are also opportunities, for example, the way we worked on minimum unit alcohol pricing. Uh, so those hard things can get agreement across parties and even on active travel. Uh, whilst we've had active travel budgets and planning, actually there are areas where people in the other main parties have got some support for that. So Cardiff, as you said, the most active city in the UK, that's because there's been a local leadership together with national leaders and people have taken on board the opportunities to do that. And it's easier in some parts of the country where the challenge is how we normalise that physical activity as a part of everyday life. You don't have to think about, I will now go and do some activity, but to make it normal for me to be active in the way we actually live day to day. Do you, do, so I guess the, the question to everyone, obviously anyone could get into power um, come May the 6th or, or just after, is the whoever gets into power is a cross party group on this and, and, and cross party work on this vital. Uh, Reen, you put the hand up first. Yeah, I, I, I agree that and we do work together, of course, you know, the, the work that we do in committees, for example, is is cross party and, you know, the committees come up with with very, very good ideas and we want governments of whichever colour to, to implement those ideas. But, you know, Politics does get in the way. We were ridiculed in Plaid Cymru for proposing a, um, a, a sweet sort of fizzy drinks um, levy years ago. We were ridiculed by all other parties uh, in, in the Assembly as it was. And, and then, of course, it became the, the norm. Um, we want now in government to look at how we can introduce a similar tax on the most unhealthy foods, um, which would hopefully encourage people uh, to change their choices on on food, but also you know uh, bring in revenue to invest in, in in the way we change our view of uh, spending on health and care as well. I'm very wary. We need to go on to the next question, Angela. Just quickly. Yeah, I'm really worried about the fact that we're just talking um, as population health being physical because it isn't. It's about the other side of it. It's about it's about the mental health. It's about you know the lady whose house I went to in Pembroke Dock where she had bubble wrap. Um, you know, over her windows to stop the draft coming through. Um, and it's 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 about um, the fact that lots of people are missing out on benefits because they don't know how to get them. And we would put in a single point um, of access so that you could go somewhere and understand all of your rights, all of your benefits. And with that, perhaps understand some of your obligations as well. You know, it's not just about the physical side of it. It's Real population health has to look at education, health and social care, you know, the community, housing and the economy to be successful and to bring people with it. We're going to have to move on. Um, data on life expectancy. This is the next question shows increasing inequalities in recent years. So health inequalities, major uh, flashpoint, especially if we've seen the statistics in, um, for example, up in the up in the valleys um, where there are uh, significant health inequalities. Um, how does your party therefore plan to invest? in the NHS in order to recognise its importance as an anchor institution and its link between unemployment, the economy and population health. The question um, has also come, uh, they're particularly interested in children and young people, adverse childhood experiences and learning disabilities. Um, let's start with uh, start with Reen. Um, uh, some very good points made in that question. You know, the role of health and care within the foundational economy in, in Wales is, is huge. Uh, again, it's why we want to make sure that we strengthen the workforce, increase opportunities for people to go into the care and health workforces because as an economic pillar, it is probably second to none uh, in, in Wales. So absolutely, we have to bear that in mind always, which is why, again, increasing the pay for the lowest paid workers within care is so, so important because you're giving people then uh, the ability to make financial uh, choices of, of, of their own. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, we need to do that. But, but let me, uh, again, remind uh, ourselves that when we think of, of spending decisions to be made by the next uh, Welsh Government, we can't just think in terms of uh, the health budget because we have to, if we are serious about tackling equality, think of the budgets for housing, think of the budgets for uh, making uh, tackling fuel poverty, think of um, budgets for giving uh, free school meals for all uh, pupils from families on universal credit because we cannot allow children to suffer from po poverty on that level. We have to think holistically. Uh, I could go on but I, I'm sensing that because time is short it'd be grateful if I winded up there. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, just a reminder that uh, we have overrun. Uh, we've had a very interesting conversation, as I'm sure everyone listening can agree. So do stay with us. Uh, Angela, um, you're up next. OK, well, I'll, and I'll reflect a lot of what Reen said, actually, because I, I agree with him. I, you know, I instinctively flinch slightly um, with your question because you cannot say to the health board or to health services, guess what, guys, you've got to fix A, B, C, D and also all that stuff over there. You know, if you look at adverse childhood experiences, one of the major adverse childhood experiences is being um, is living within a home in which there is domestic abuse. You know, that can't be something that the health board has to fix. They might provide the solutions, they might help, and it's got to be integrated. But but I, I I'm always slightly worried when people look to one organisation, um, you know, schools or another area where people go, well, the school can fix everything and actually they can't. It comes back down to this integration issue, you know, it's uh, and it's about having this holistic response to people and, you know, Reem coined, coined that term. Whatever your need, we have to look at how we can meet it and we may use health and or education and or police services and or social care and or all sorts of other things. But don't just sort of look at health uh, because it is a powerful beast with a lot of money behind it and say, actually, your job is to fix everything because it, it can't. So uh, a more joined up uh, approach with uh, different sections <laughs> of the government per se. Um, and Vaughan? Well, you see some of that starting with purpose already. In the way the economic contract offers support for businesses but has expectation of where those businesses behave. It isn't just work that helps with healthcare inequalities, it's actually good work. Decent work with decent terms and conditions makes a huge difference to people, people's health outcomes, physical and mental. And it deals with the point about um, adverse childhood experiences. Part of the challenge isn't just about the health service being aware of those, it's actually about other services too. So we've done lots of work already with police services around Wales. They're aware of who they're dealing with and the reality that has a direct impact on children, their prospects for the future. The same thing for a wide range of public services and the way they now work together. I actually think that in Wales, we're much more aware of those experiences on children and what that means for them, the families they live in and the communities they live in. And our challenge is how you turn that into something real so it doesn't just become an academic discussion or a discussion between professionals about other people but how that gets into how you change the way that individuals families and communities get to make choices for themselves and for health the health service i think it's really important to be really clear the health service is not the major responsible body for healthcare inequalities as they're created has to deal with those healthcare inequalities, but healthcare inequalities are almost always from the most significant economic inequalities. But as a major employer, we of course have a role. So in the town centre first approach we're taking, the new generation of integrated health and care centres, having those in or near town centres will help to make sure that uh, there is a, a greater likelihood uh, of people coming to those town centres, the economic activity that goes with it. It's also where the contract reform process, and in particular pharmacy and optometry, for example, in some areas, those are anchor parts of keeping a high street going with all the footfall and traffic gets driven into them. So having more healthcare services improves access for people, but it also has a wider economic benefit as well. So needing to see this in broader terms about how health money has a broader impact, but not, as Angela said, not expecting the health service to sort all of those problems out. That takes a much wider view. Thank you very much, all three. Um, sorry, um, for no comebacks there. We just um, we're a bit over time. And I really want to ask this question. Actually, um, question three in population health: Evidence continues to emerge that the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected women and people from Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities. What are your plans to bring about change to support different communities and groups and ensure a fairer society? Uh, Vaughan, would you like to kick us off on that? And actually, it's been interesting about the direct impact in each of those areas. So mortality affected more men than women. But actually, when it comes to the direct impact on how women have lived their lives, children not being in school, well, that's meant and the expectations that women still undertake disproportionately more caring responsibilities. It's had a real crowding effect of women and work and their ability to go out and actually use their talent uh, and not be expected to stay at home. So there have been big challenges and I think we have got some progress to remake in that area. And of course, with people who look like me, you know, we've undertaken risk assessments. We had specific work done looking at what's happening with our staff 
and then try and understand what we're going to need to do in the future. Because many of the inequalities that affect black and Asian origin communities in Wales are because they're disproportionately, we are disproportionately represented in our least well off communities as well. That's why the points about the economic regeneration and recovery we need to see are so important, because if you don't resolve that, we're going to have continuing healthcare inequalities. You know, we've been more successful than other parts of the UK in not having the same mortality impact of the pandemic, but it's an absolutely consistent pattern that where you have your least well off communities, you will have your highest impact. And it's why when you think about what we need to do with whether it's the support for self isolation, whether it's the additional support we provided for local government, the additional services we put in, actually those things help, but the transformation is even more important to remake an economic future that is a fairer one, a greener one, but fundamentally fairness for the future is going to be essential if we're going to turn around that public health impact. So societal change um, and, and a, a, a big feature there. Um, Reen, uh, would you agree with that? What are your thoughts on it? Put simply, um, this has to be a turning point, I think, in, in so many ways. Um, the statistics that, that, that you mentioned, there are others too. And I think what COVID, what this pandemic has done is to highlight um, deep inequalities that we that we already had in our um, communities and it's not going to be uh, me devising you know the ways um, to address that but what we need is a government that is absolutely determined to do all the work that is necessary now to identify the ways in which we can uh, tackle those inequalities we, we know what some of them are of course you know and, and, and poverty ha has been one of the um, the biggest measures of how likely somebody is to be affected adversely by by COVID. It's a, it's a stark reminder of what inequalities uh, in our communities uh, does. And if you belong to a particular group, you are more likely to have, have suffered. So we need that research and we need a government that will act uh, on, on, on what we find. And it could even, you know, um, Stress to long COVID as well, which is something that I've, uh, you know, particular interest in. You know, we're we're, we're going to be learning, and we, we need to be investing right now uh, in making sure that where there are groups that are particularly uh, badly affected with that too, that they get the help that they want. Uh, Reen uh, picks up a very big point there. I think the ONS uh, said that around roughly estimate 56,000 people mm -hmm. suffering from long COVID at the moment. And I'm sure um, the the, the, the um, people from long COVID Wales who I think are listening will be glad that you've brought that up. And I'm sure it's a priority for all three candidates here. Uh, Angela, um, what, uh, what yes. do you think about the question? Yeah, I mean, um, well, let me tell the people listening from long COVID Wales that you will see in our manifesto um, an absolute commitment to developing long COVID clinics, which we would then seek to expand over time to encompass a lot of people because, you know, there are similarities as well as dissimilarities about supporting people after they've had major illnesses, whether they be physical illnesses or mental health illnesses. People need to be able to regroup, to be supported, to develop their strength, to have you know, all of the services put to them um, and easy access to them in order to be able to get as well as they can be uh, to go forward. And I think that's a really vital part of what we need to provide. You know, it's got to be more than the mandatory sort of or statutory, you know, six weeks of physio or whatever it may be. It's got to be what that individual person wants. And then just moving on to the, the question quickly, because we are, um, I am aware of the time. And, and, and it is, and it is a turning point. Um, you know, I absolutely agree with Reen, and, and I and I know Vaughan does, because we've, we've talked about these kind of things our, between ourselves. Um, it is a turning point. This is our opportunity to actually reframe the whole of the way we deliver population health. You know, and you can't just say because of COVID, we're going to specifically, you know, go into um, ethnic minority communities perhaps and try to, because it's everybody, is anybody who's poor, is anybody who's out of the um, the ambit of uh, what we consider to be the mainstream. They're all people who've been marginalised or left behind for whatever reason it may be. And there are multitudes of reasons 
as to why that's happened. If we truly want to transform our population health, it comes back to health and social care, education, you know, the community involvement, all of the processes we have in communities like flying starts, um, are looking at our housing needs, and, and I agree 100% with Vaughan about having a strong economy, because that's one of the major things that can shift your population and to help to improve outcomes for everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, root cause is definitely um, something that the next government will be looking at by the sounds of it. Um, uh, we'll move on to the next section. Uh, sorry again to the audience, we are running uh, a bit over, but we've had such um, interesting chats about these policy areas. Um, so it's, it's great to hear uh, all three parties. Next is collaborative delivery of care and services. Um, we've got two more videos, um, one from the uh, BMA Cymru Wales, British Medical Association, and the uh, Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry. Good evening. The last 12 months have completely changed everything, but in many ways the problems of the NHS were already there around our staffing levels, around the size of our hospitals and around our waiting lists. All of those for one reason or another have got much worse in the last 12 to 15 months and we need to start communicating better, collaborating better to try and get ourselves back to a, a level playing field so that our patients can get the treatments they deserve and they need as soon as possible. The right investment can lead to better communication uh, using some of the new technologies that have been developed over the last 12 months and using those to actually improve our patient care going forward. By listening to staff and patients about their experience, there's an opportunity to implement some of the new technologies around electronic prescribing, around clear information sharing between all parts of the NHS uh, to try and improve the services that we provide for our patients in collaboration with all of our colleagues in the NHS and in social care. Thanks. My name is Rick Greville and I'm Director of the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry, ABPI Cymru Wales. As we've all seen over the last year, medicines and vaccines are transforming our lives like never before. At ABPI, we are proud that our members have developed and delivered vaccines and treatments to address the pandemic, whilst continuing to supply cutting edge therapies. Creating an NHS fit for the future is about embracing new technologies, ensuring patients in Wales have access to world-class standards of care and disease prevention. We know that working collaboratively the next Welsh Government can deliver this because since 2016, the groundbreaking new treatment fund has strengthened and accelerated access to the newest treatments. Continuation of this progressive £80 million fund will enable routine adoption of all medicines found to be clinically and cost effective wherever you are in Wales. We look forward to continuing our work with colleagues across health and social care, as we know only too well, we are always stronger together. Brilliant to hear from each of these um, groups, and I'm sure um, the, the, the three politicians are also listening to what they uh, they have to say and taking it on board. Um, next uh, section, um, collaborative delivery of care and services. Um, again, you can use the hashtag CNF2021 if you want to get uh, involved with the conversation. Um, question one, um, it's important that all parts of health and the social care system work together as we recover from COVID. What collaboration between the public sector, the third sector and the private sector is needed to ensure we have an innovative and sustainable health and care system? Uh, Angela, I'll let you start on that. I actually think that one of the, um, the positives, probably about the only positive, I think that uh, we had out of the pandemic has been seeing collaboration work at an extraordinary level and extraordinary pace between um, local authorities, health and the health board. I mean, they've, 
you know, they, they, they've pulled a, they pulled the rabbit out of the bag. And as I said in my opening statement, it's about capturing that energy and that can do and that that ability to move through the inertia, capturing it. Let's bottle that lightning and let's keep it going forward. That's one of the things that we absolutely need to take. You know, let's not go back to the stuffy ways of working where we went up and down our silos before we went across. Um, and there have been outstanding examples of how well it's worked across Wales. And that's what we need to look at, to examine and to multiply um, throughout Wales. It's really important. And I also just want to add one other thing, which is um, I think that if you really want to drive true integration of health and social care, you have to look at pooling budgets. You have to look at ensuring that the money follows the person, not the money follows the discipline. And I think that, um, you know, it's a brave course of action. It's a complicated course of action to actually think your way through and to come up with a way of making it happen. But it is one of the drivers. Money is probably the key driver to really enabling that collaboration. Um, and, you know, at the moment, the, the scales on the balance are, 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 are tipped the wrong way or they're out of kilter. They're not in sync. Do you think there needs to be a major change in the system as it stands? Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about frontline system, you know, I'm not saying right, we're all going to change that, but how we manage it at the back end, how we empower the people in the health departments, in the social care departments, in local authorities, whatever departments you can add in, all the public services. And, you know, it was it was part of the um, the sort of ambition of the Future Generations Act was to try and make some of that happen. Um, and, you know, we've just done quite a big inquiry onto its successes and it's mixed um, and we can learn from that and we can actually start trying to use that kind of thought process and methodology and sustainability to make that collaboration work. But let's be under no illusions. One of the key drivers of absolutely anything is money. He who holds the purse strings has the power and we need to really have a look at how we can pull money to drive some of that change, drive some of that collaboration. But I do want to pay a real tribute, uh, Peter, before, you know, I know we're out of time, but I do want to pay a real tribute because I do think that all of these public uh, departments have been phenomenal in the last year. Um, you know, while still staying safe, while still having appropriate governance, they basically ripped up the rule book and said, right, we're going to work fast, quick to respond to this crisis. Let's keep that mentality and drive it through. And you spoke there about he who holds the purse strings. Next up to Vaughan, who maybe not runs the uh, the, the purse strings, but has um, impl uh, the policy, I suppose. Vaughan. Well, it's a, a really interesting set of questions about how we can do this. We have examples of this already. Um, so the new treatment fund is a good example of a government choice that's required greater collaboration and working between the private sector but also with a health service to deliver it. And actually it's opening up new opportunities for further work as well. I think actually the approach that we've taken uh, in this area has been one of the things when that Pfizer invested in a research project with Swansea University, the way our healthcare system is set up, they chose to come here rather than a university institution in England because of the way our health system is set up and the opportunities to work right across it. And if you look at examples of where we already deliver work between private, public and third sector, you see that in social prescribing uh, and you can expect more of that in the future, a key manifesto commitment, but also in tier zero mental health services. Many of those services are directly delivered by the third sector. So actually some of that collaboration where that partnership works, I think will improve more in the future. And the pandemic has absolutely driven a further transformation and acceleration in those relationships. Uh, beforehand with a healthier Wales to try to deliver the recommendations of the parliamentary review, I made a deliberate choice that money for transformation could only be released if local partners from the third sector, the health service and local government agreed on how to use that money. Otherwise, there was a real danger of seeing as health money that other people then need to try to get a portion of. In the pandemic, that starting point has really been accelerated. And after, to be honest, in the first few months of the pandemic, it wasn't necessarily all easy. You now see health and local government working much more effectively together. And the challenge is to make sure the third sector aren't frozen out. And I'm confident we'll see more of that genuine work together in the next uh, in the next Senate term. 
Uh, Angela, just quickly before Reen. Well, I, I, I just want to say, I, I, you know, I agree with a, a, um, a lot of the analysis there that um, Vaughan's put forward, but I do, I do also want to quickly add in, and I'm sure Reen might want to build on it more. Is the pandemic's also shown us a difference in collaboration with the citizen over their health, over their, you know, if you like, their their, their destiny, um, and that's changed. There's definitely been a tipping point in how people view health and social care and their um, their responses to it. And we need to try to build on that and move that forward and, uh, because that's been transformational in so many areas. Um, and uh, Reen? Yeah, and people want us to do it. Now is the time uh, to be to be doing radical things. Going back um, how long? Two, two years probably, um, Plaid Company set up our care commission. And um, one of our uh, key um, recommendations was to establish a national health and care service. Now, to me, what we've lived through over the past year just shows me how much that is needed uh, now. That is our declaration of intent, if you like. It's not the trigger for a major structural change. We don't need to replace our health boards or our local authorities. I have my thoughts about Betty Gidwalid, which we may or may not have had time to talk about. But we need a different way of ensuring that the collaboration actually happens formally between care and health and to get rid of the arbitrary sort of dividing lines between them that we currently are seeing. There are very good examples of collaboration, including in my neck, my neck of the woods, where the council and the health board do absolutely work um, well together. The transformation fund, uh, Angela and I remember sitting through an inquiry by the health uh, by the health committee and in, in, in the Senate, where, as far as I could see, nobody really knew what the transformation fund was for. And if you talk to ten different people about how they wanted to use it, they, the ten of them had different ideas. And the budget was was ultimately too small too. We need the core of health and care spending to be delivered through new frameworks. Mm -hmm. To me, the National Health and Care Service is about delivering national frameworks, not just for health, not just for care, but the way that they formally work together to make sure that money follows the person's needs and there's no, as I say, arbitrary lines between what social care and what's, what's health care. There are good uh, international uh, examples. Sweden gives us a very uh, good one. My Swedish isn't very good, but the Nortalia uh, model where they you know, brought together uh, social and health uh, care spending. So we need to be innovative on this in Wales and now is the time uh, to do it. I think um, I think a scal means cheers in 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 Swedish. Um, that's the, all that I know. But uh, Vaughan, do you quickly want to come back to anything said there? Yeah, look, and in in some of this area, we've seen a real acceleration in progress. It's practical, and I always said the transformation fund would be about having different approaches in different parts of Wales to transform services, but it has to be time limited to, to then make sure that you're doing something with your core budgets and your core relationships. So much of this, there isn't a large area of disagreement. The challenge is actually getting there, and when we had the parliamentary review, there was agreement on the broader point and it always then comes down to the practical choices and the change you need to see happen. We've got to equip our staff and support them working across different organisations to actually get on and deliver and the pandemic has shown it can happen. I am um, sorry Angela, I really do need to move on. Uh, you've all had ample opportunity to speak there. Um, uh, we're, uh, just, uh, we need to keep this quite uh, sharpish. Um, advances in innovation during the pandemic have assisted many patients in rural communities to access healthcare. How will you ensure that those who experience digital or geographical exclusion can access the assistance they need in the future? Um, let's start with uh, Reen on that one. Uh, because time is short, I'll give you one idea that I would really like to see um, developed and delivered, which is the, the introduction of a new role, which would be a, if I don't know what you call it, a digital medical nursing community assistant. I don't know. Basically, we've seen that you that that uh, uh, consultations from a distance uh, using digital technology can work, but it's not going to work for everybody. It works for me. But it's not going to work for uh, for some people who have mobility, uh, uh, digital inclusion issues, and so on. How about taking part of the health uh, 
uh, sector into somebody's house so that you're taking the technology, you're taking the digital link, you are uh, introducing a conduit to a, a conversation with a doctor or an advanced nurse practitioner, whoever it might be back, in, back at base, uh, and, and sort of building on the fact that we have a new appetite for trying different things and that we recognise that the things that work well for some, and I'm guessing the four of us on the screen here, won't work for others. So just an idea, but kicking on from where we are now, you know, making the, the some of the developments standard, you know, not going back to doing things as we were, and actually identifying what we could do differently through ideas such as that one uh, to reach the, into people's homes that don't have the technology there already. Angela, you're in a um, rural constituency. Your views on this? Yeah, I think it's. IT is not a panacea for everything. Um, I think that we've made some extraordinary um, strides forward. Um, and, um, and I think that the use of digital technologies to be able to uh, talk to people, to be able to do, you know, offer diagnoses, to be able to deliver medicines, um, organise things, you know, is, is absolutely fantastic. But it doesn't work for everybody. And it also um, doesn't do an, a number of other really important things, which is all about tying people in together. Um, it's about making sure that um, that the the elderly, the the poorer people, the people who don't have you know IT uh, um, availability <laughs> in my constituency, you know, <laughs> and broadband in some areas. Um, you know, it's really really clear. We've got to make sure we don't lose them. So what we need to do is ensure that we carry on preventing and putting money into community services and ensuring that people do not then have to travel for 30, 40, 50 miles to go and see somebody, but they can go to a community uh, outpost near them to get that digital, you know, access to digital uh, consultations and all the rest of it. A slightly separate conversation, I know, but I, I could wax lyrical on what we need to do to IT to improve IT in Wales. Because overall, throughout our entire health and social care service, we are still in the dark ages in too many places. We do not have a handle on it. There are too many systems, a lot of them written on the back of little access programs on somebody's PC. You know, we should sweep all this away. Look to Europe. You know, you go into European hospitals. Um, they do not have notes. It's all laptop based everybody's digitized go to somewhere like croatia you get a credit card you walk into any doctor you can stick your credit card in the slot and immediately in front of that doctor comes your entire history you know there is so much we could do um, but, and that would really free up people that would enable people to have real control over access to their health information and more importantly allow other people who are trying to help them understand what their real situation is Born, is it uh, Europe that we should be looking at for the next five years? Well, we'll always be able to learn what's happening in Europe, things that we want to emulate and do more of, as well as things that we don't want to do as well. And it's important we have a genuine open ended approach to our relationships with other modern developed healthcare systems. I think going back to the question, I think there are two, two broad points to make. The first is that actually access through IT has been a really good thing to come out of the pandemic. The progress we've made has been extraordinary in a very short period of time. The national rollup we've seen would have taken years to achieve otherwise. And it's one of my frustrations is about not being able to deliver more change more quickly within the brief. But it won't put to one side the need to have proper relationship based healthcare Absolutely. in primary and secondary care. Mm -hmm. So it's the balance moving forward. It's not about undoing the changes happened. And that's actually a benefit to staff um, as well as to the patient, the patient as well. So when I go and get my blood test, um, I don't always have to go in after that to have the appointment. Now that's a good system that works for me, but actually making that more um, more syst systematic through our system would be good for people like me and others who then need that contact time with their clinician are more likely to get it and to get value from it as well. There's an awful lot of reform that when you look at it on paper, it may not make sense for someone's experience of healthcare and the quality of care that someone can deliver. It's a really big area of gain. Um, and let's move on uh, uh, quickly to the next section, social and community care. Um, and we've got a video by the Royal College of Nursing Wales. Good evening everybody and thank you for joining us today. 
My name's Helen Wiley and I'm the director at RCM Wales. I'm sorry not to be with you this evening, but I was really pleased to be able to make a contribution and introduce to you the community and care home section this evening and talk to you about the value of nurses and nursing staff who work in these settings. It won't be a surprise for many of you to know that most nurses don't work in a hospital. There are a wide range of nursing professionals all working in the community and the range is very wide. It includes learning disability nurses, dementia nurses, mental health nurses, school nurses, district nurses, health visitors and many more. Community nurses help people live independently. They help people stay at home and receive care with dignity, but they also provide highly complex clinical care. District nurses are a linchpin of many community teams, but unfortunately their numbers are dwindling. Community nursing needs urgent investment and in our manifesto, Vote for Nursing, we ask the next Welsh Government to increase the number of district nurses and urgently invest in community information technology systems and handheld devices. Registered nurses in care homes are vital and never has a time such as this pandemic shown that every care home across Wales needs more. Specialist nurses such as infection prevention and control nurses, stroke specialist nurses and dementia care nurses are needed to span the health and social care divide and bring specialist knowledge to care homes. Care homes should have access to consultant nurses in the same way that nurses working in the NHS have access to consultant nurses. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear how valuable registered nurses and nursing staff are in care homes. They have gone above and beyond in the face of unprecedented challenges to care for our loved ones throughout these crises. I have spoken to many who've moved out of their own homes in order to do that. And unfortunately, I'm aware of some who've paid the ultimate price and have lost their lives. But this isn't specific, this commitment to COVID-19. Registered nurses provide dedicated care before the pandemic and they'll continue to do that after the pandemic. Nursing is a people business and we want to invest in our people. The next Welsh Government needs to raise the profile of registered nursing in care homes providing professional recognition as well as pay terms and conditions equal to those of their other colleagues. Not only will this show nurses in care homes that they are valued, but it will make it an attractive career option to nursing students or returning nurses, which could lead to a much need improvement in the numbers of nurses employed within care homes. Our care home animation will explain just how important care home nursing is and why care homes need urgent investment. So thank you for giving me some time today and I'm sure it will be a lively and interesting meeting. And uh, just quickly there, uh, thank you to, uh, to to carers who worked throughout the pandemic as well. I've um, uh, My brother's in a care home in Carmarthenshire and they've been fantastic with him when in a time when I couldn't see him. So I just wanted to use this platform to say thank you to, uh, to carers. Um, this will be pretty quick fire. Uh, social and community care, question one. With budgets and working practices varying so much, how would you like health and social care to work closer together and how will you ensure all aspects are appropriately funded? Um, Vaughan? Uh, well, that's why I think our pledge for the, the the reform of the social care framework, the white paper we produced before uh, the election period is so important because you've got to have a new framework for that social care is going to work uh, because our ability to deliver the real living wage in the care said we rely on us having a a way to bargain across the sector to make that stick and to have the local ability to be appropriate in the way that care is delivered but a real national frame to make sure that it is something that people can rely on in every part of the country and if we don't do that then we'll continue to see a sector where there are some real shining stars whether that's delivered directly by health or local government for the care sectors they directly provide or run or indeed the private, the independent sector, some very good independent sector and housing association run facilities as well. But we all know there's real variation in the sector. We need to level up all of that care. That's why that national framework is so important in practical terms. You may not see it on a leaflet, but it could make a huge difference in improving the quality of care and the terms and conditions for our staff. Um, let's go to Angela. 
Yeah, when we started this uh, this hustings right at the very beginning, and we talked about the uh, independent pay review and uh, you know, the Welsh Conservatives, what we would do, and I was really clear during that piece um, that one of the big areas that people aren't talking about that need to be looked at was this levelling up, this ensuring that if you are a nurse performing a certain type of function, doesn't matter whether you're in a care home, whether you're in a hospital, whether you're in a GP surgery, that you know you are treated with equality, parity, and that you have um, the same the same support, the same training opportunities, uh, the same pay, and that's uh, what we would look at. As for um, continuing to ensure, you know, I listened to what Helen had to say in her piece there. Yeah, we are. We're running out of community nurses. I know in Halvar we've had a massive um, downturn on district nursing because. People are retiring and we're not filling in at the bottom. That comes back to what I said at the beginning. It's all about the workforce. We don't have enough of lots and lots of different types of, of uh, roles in place. We need to increase it and we need to be brave and put our money behind it and substantially increase those training places, get the recruitment going, get the apprenticeships going, bring people in so they can earn uh, while they learn and just start building up the whole um, the whole workforce. where overstretched and um, you know Helen made a uh, I, I watched her standing outside the Senate um, a couple of weeks ago and she talked very eloquently about the fact that um, you know nurses and the medical profession are on their knees they're absolutely exhausted having supported that us all through that pandemic supported people like your brother my parents you know people are needing that break we haven't got the staff we have to do this as a matter of urgency it's got to be our number one priority sorting out reinforcing and making our workforce completely sustainable. And Reem? I heard your dad uh, talking about the care your brother was getting uh, in a wonderful Radio Cymru interview with Betty George a few weeks ago and, and I know we, we can all after this year thank uh, care workers for the care that they have given to people that we know and, uh, and love within our own families and within our own communities. I think we, we've addressed um, the, the question in a way of, of how we'd bring care and uh, uh, well, social care and, and health care together. Just, just to, to sort of comment a, a bit on the um, the staffing element in, in response to the points raised by, by Helen. And I've discussed this with, with Helen. I'm, I'm really excited about the kind of plans that we have in place for the integration of, of health and care through a national health and care service. What the integration of uh, terms and conditions of employment for care and health staff would mean in terms of providing new journeys uh, for careers within uh, within health uh, and care. So you're bringing people into the care sector and automatically they're within a system that allows them perhaps to go off on a journey towards nursing, to becoming hopefully registered nursing, nurses within care who can then go backwards and forwards between uh, the health and the care sector. I think there are real opportunities uh, there. Listen, we can, we can do so much. I don't think we, we addressed the last question well on, on the role of the third sector within the delivery of, of, of care, for example. Wonderful examples in Italy, I know, of how the third sector provide much more of a proportion of the care um, overall than, than we see here. There's so much that can be done, whilst of course we'll be reliant on the private sector to be de delivering it as well. But we can, I'm convinced, deliver something that is more sustainable, that provides more career pathways for uh, for uh, nurses and you know care workers in general. And as I say, now's the time to do it because the people have remembered the value of care. Thank you. Uh, one final question and then, and then the closing remarks, because I'm, I'm sure um, some of you need to be places with the um, with the campaign um, and something that's popped up a lot during uh, the pandemic. How will your party ensure those working in care homes and the wider social care sector are valued and receive fair pay and terms and conditions equal to the health sector? Uh, Reen, I'll let you start on that one. Um, I, I'll keep it to just a few seconds. As I've said, we want the integration of health and care. That means the integration of terms and conditions. £10 minimum pay uh, just for starters to do immediately when we're in government. But we have to find a way of providing parity of pay, but also parity of esteem right across health and care that we currently have not got. Uh, and, and it's something that I'm you know, really looking forward to having the opportunity, hopefully, to get into grips within government. Uh, let's go to uh, Vaughan next. Well, we've got a headline commitment on paying 
staff in the care sector the real living wage and that's going to be affordable and deliverable that's got to go alongside the restructure of the sector that we talked about otherwise it'll be nearly impossible to achieve in practice and the challenge then is uh, how do we make sure the people are valued in the system they go into they're valued by the staff they work alongside they're valued by the public and actually we can continue to invest in that and those choices won't be easy you know it can be a bit glib every night and say we will pay more and we'll deliver more and actually i can tell you with income there are incredibly difficult choices at what to deliver and what you can't do and having been a minister through the back end of a decade of austerity i can tell you those challenges were incredibly difficult then and they'll be more so in the future we have a plan that is credible it is about valuing our care workers. I've already delivered on that in terms of the bonus we provided to the social care workers first, then to health and social care, and we expect to do more with pay and esteem and more integration across health and social care. Uh, Angela, do you think the uh, care sector is valued enough? No, I don't. And um, I know that I'm deeply grateful to them because of the care sector. Um, people that are very close to me are able to live the life that they want to live. You know, when I'm old and grey, I want to be old and grey in my own home and I'm going to need somebody to come and help me to probably to stay there. We, you know, the care carers and the care sector enable us, all of us, to actually have the kind of life we want. Without them, we would all have to have completely different choices made for us. We wouldn't have that choice. We wouldn't have that empowerment. That's a great gift. And isn't it extraordinary? Because we see that somebody who tends us in a bed in a hospital is giving us a great gift, but we do not equate it with somebody who tends us in a bed in a care home or somebody who comes into our home and helps get us out of a bed and helps get us downstairs and helps prepare something for us. We don't see that as the same kind of gift but it is because it's about allowing us to live the kind of life that we need and we need to get that message out the way we get that out is by paying people properly and by developing a proper career structure so if you are 16 or 17 or 18 or 22 and you're thinking what am i going to do do i want to go into care oh that's all just dealing with the difficult stuff actually it's not it's richly rewarding personally you form fantastic relationships with people you can really make a difference to the life of another human being. That's a pretty good job to have. And if you're paid well, you've got a career structure, you're able to develop your personal and your professional skills, and you can have a career path if you want. You know, that's what we need to do. That's how we will then get more people to come and work um, in a sector that is vital, absolutely vital to the long term sustainability of us as individual human beings because trust me we're all going to get to a point where we're going to need some kind of support these are the amazing people who deliver it thank you very much that um that signals the end of the questions part of the hosting sorry that it ran over a little bit i was trying to keep to the timings but they were very uh important and significant questions to answer ahead of the next five years of of covid recovery and and the future for, for, for a lot of us. Um, next up is three minutes to make closing uh, remarks. Your chance to wow the audience and, and maybe even get their vote on the on the 6th of May. Uh, we started the hustings with Reen and Angela, then Vaughan. So let's go, Vaughan, you first, three minutes. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to, to join you tonight. And uh, thank you for everything you've done, not just in the pandemic, um, but through all the time that I've been the deputy and then uh, the cabinet minister for health in the government. Uh, sometimes my colleagues in government ask me why I do the job because it's big, difficult and demanding. And I regularly say you meet amazing people. You meet amazing patients who have had their lives transformed and changed by what our NHS and social care system does. And you also meet amazing staff who have always gone above and beyond. And you recognise what that commitment means. The pandemic has changed so many things. I think it's reinforced people's understanding of how lucky we are to live in a country where we have a national care service, where we have a national health service that will look after you, where we now recognise even more so the importance of our care system. Much of what we talked about today won't feature in headline debates and won't feature in many doorstep conversations, but it will be a huge part of transforming Wales for the future. Our number one pledge 
is about getting through the pandemic and a recovery post COVID. That will require more change and more reform. And whoever, what, whichever one of us is a minister in a future government, it will still require you to be able to deliver that, to transform the way that health and care works. I hope that, it, uh, that what you've heard tonight and is in our manifesto is something that you can buy into and believe in. The track record we have in Welsh Labour, the personal commitment and the time that we've given. But through even this, the most difficult year and a bit of my ministerial life, it really has been a privilege to serve. So regardless of the outcome, thank you for everything you've done, not just for me and my family personally, because we're still users of the service. Thank you for everything you already have done for Wales and what you will continue to do, regardless of tonight's deliberations and regardless of the election result in a few weeks time. Uh, Angela? Yes, well, much like uh, Vaughan, I actually I want to say a, a massive thank you as well. Um, my family have had cause to use the National Health Service, uh, not for COVID reasons. And, um, you know, we, we found that uh, it was not wanting and it really stood up and stepped forward. And people have been absolutely amazing. And I've heard stories from my constituents um, of desperation and fear and worry and where you know we've seen the stresses and the fractures but also stories of you know where they've had outstanding support from either their care worker their gp or some consultant in a hospital who's made that personal telephone call and put their mind at rest so you know massive massive thank you i think the pandemic has actually though shown that spotlight very clearly on where the stresses and fractures are within the uh services we knew it before we went into the pandemic i mean goodness me we've had endless committee meetings to discuss it you all out there have come and lobbied us all multiple times because you're on the front line you know what the problems are you know um or believe you have ways of being able to improve that and it's up to us to listen so as i started at the very beginning to say you know prevention is better than a cure and that there are two key um areas the first absolute truth is we cannot transform without having proper money in the right place to really help sustain people. And um, when Vaughan talked earlier about the parliamentary review, that was one of the big things that came across, that too often green shoots got stifled because we didn't have that sustainability to let them grow. And the second thing is the workforce. And I can tell you now that the Welsh Conservative manifesto is all about the workforce and about delivering for the people of Wales. Finally, I just want to be able to say um, that the other thing the pandemic's done is it allowed us to have a different conversation with our citizens, with the people who use our services and the people within those services. And that conversation has got to carry on because we cannot sustain going back to where we were and then expecting the poor old NHS, and our poor old social care to be able to carry on for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. There's not enough money to be able to sustain it properly and how we want it. And there aren't enough people to sustain it. And it's just not the right way for modern healthcare and modern care services going into the 21st century. So, you know, we've got to keep that dialogue going, keep those barriers down. And the Welsh Conservatives, I promise you, transformation, workforce and listening to what you say we need to do on the front line to make those differences. Just in the nick of time on that three minutes there and uh, Reen finally uh, last remarks from uh, Plaid Cymru. I'll keep my comments short. Uh, I'm sure you've heard enough from Angela and Vaughan and myself uh, for one evening plus my son needs to get to rugby training for the first time <laughs> in, in four months. Listen I, um, I go for my first jab on on Friday, um, my wife and one of my daughters aren't theirs because of uh, existing health conditions. My wife's very uh, happy to say that I'm the first one in our family to have it based on age. So there, there's me having another opportunity to say thank you uh, at the uh, at the end of this uh, this year. Um, we've said thank you many times. We've said dioch, we have clapped, uh, and we have. Uh, said a, a heartfelt thanks uh, to those looking after us uh, right across health and care. I'll just say uh, this, the biggest thanks that we can give is to make the correct and sometimes the brave political decisions uh, needed to put health and care on 
a sustainable footing, sustainable in terms of its workforce and taking the pressure off the brilliant uh, staff that we have right across health and care, sustainable in terms of its finances, sustainable in terms of the health and well-being of uh, our nation. That is the challenge that faces whoever will be health minister after May the 6th. Plaid Cymru is ready uh, to play our part in delivering uh, that, uh, and so am I. Uh, and thank you um, for this evening too. So after this lively conversation, it's been brilliant to hear a wide range of discussions um, from mental health to physical health to what we need to do to recover from the pandemic and um, of course on, on NHS services um, and uh, everything that relates to, to you, the listeners in this hustings. Um, but I'd like to draw the meeting to a close. It's been a, a pleasure and I'm, I was delighted when I got the uh, the message to uh, to come and uh, to come and chair these hustings. I only started journalism uh, two years ago and health was one of the main reasons that I went into it. Previously, having done a, a master's in economics with particular focus on health economics. Um, and of course, my my brother has been the driving force behind me and um, it's been brilliant to, uh, to, to get to know the health uh, patch, as they call it in the journalism industry um, throughout the course of, of the year. Obviously, very sad stories um, as well heard from communities up and down um, the, the, the country. Um, but yeah, as I draw this to a close, I'd like to say um, a massive thank you to um, the three politicians, Angela Burns of the Welsh Conservatives, Renap Yodwath of Plaid Cymru and Vaughan Gething of Welsh Labour. Um, I'm at Gillibrand Peter on Twitter and us at Global, um, so LBC Heart and Capital. I had to do a plug, I'm sorry. Um, we're always after uh, stories uh, uh, <laughs> of, of any sort. Um, so, uh, so so do make sure you message us um, uh, there. But yeah, I draw this hustings to, um, to, to a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. What's that? Bye.